Hello everyone, my name is Rachel. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am bringing you guys my Tis the Season-a-thon weekly reading vlog and I am really pumped about this vlog because I haven't done a reading vlog in three months. I think over three months at this point because I was looking on my channel and the last reading vlog I did was for the historical romance readathon that happened back in August, I think. So it's been a while. I've talked about this on my channel before, but I just haven't really been motivated to make reading vlogs lately because they are the videos that get the least amount of views. And that's all over booktube. That's not just my channel. Um, and they take a lot of work to make, but I am so pumped about Tis the Seasonathon. I did daily vlogs actually for last year's readathon and I will link that playlist up in the cards above. That was such a fun time because I went to Orlando and my mom and I went to Disney World and Universal Studios that week so I got tons and tons of footage at the parks and it was a fun time for the most part but unfortunately my mom did get sick halfway through that trip so it wasn't perfect or anything but I'm really glad that I documented that whole trip nonetheless. Um, so this week is going to be a lot less exciting than last year's readathon. Right now I don't really have many work commitments because of COVID and everything so it'll just be a really chill reading vlog for the most part but I am just so excited about the TBR that I have planned for this week. Um, so what I'm going to do is put the graphic over here for all of the prompts for Tis the Seasonathon. I will also link their Twitter account down below so that you can be notified about next year's readathon. And I did talk about this TBR in my December TBR, if you're curious, I will link that up in the cards above as well. So the first one we have, read a holiday themed book. And for that one, I'm going with A Very Highland Holiday, which is a bind up of historical romance novellas. I got this off of NetGalley and I think this is gonna be the book that I start with first. Then we have read a book you meant to get to this year, but didn't and read a diverse book. I am counting this book for both of those prompts and that's going to be The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. I am so pumped for this book. Well, I'm pumped for all of them. I feel like I say the same things over and over again in my TBR videos, um, but it's true. I'm excited about this book and I bought this some months back. I think this came out in 2020 and literally everyone I follow that has read this book has given it five stars and I have a feeling that I'm gonna love it as well. So then I have another book that's gonna count for two prompts and that is read a book with lights on the cover and the bonus group book which is In a Holidays by Christina Lauren. This was a book that I was already planning on reading in December anyway so I'm really excited that it could count for a couple of prompts. And then the last prompt I have on here is a cozy read and I am reading two short novellas short stories for this. The first one is The Greatest Gift. Keep forgetting the author's name, um, but of course I'll put the cover over here. This is the source material for the movie It's a Wonderful Life, and I think it's only like 30 pages. I know the audiobook's only 50 minutes, so I'm gonna breeze through that. I might even listen to that today at some point. Um, and then another cozy read that I want to listen to is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I have read so many adaptations and watched so many adaptations of this story that it's well past time that I read the original story. So I'm really excited about all of these books that I have on this TBR. So as for today, um, I actually have a little bit of time. I need to go eat lunch. And then in about 30 minutes, I'm actually teaching a voice lesson for my sister. So in the last month or so, I have been giving voice lessons to my older sister who lives in the UK. She used to sing a lot when we were younger and she hasn't been singing so much in recent years. So I'm really excited that she's been getting back into singing and I have been having such a fun time teaching lessons for her. So yeah, I have that lesson and then I think I'm either going to start A Very Highland Holiday, which I don't have an audiobook for, or I might start the audiobook for either A Christmas Carol or The Greatest Gift because I have some like cleaning to do in my room. So yeah, with that being said, I will update you guys soon.
it is later on Monday night. Let's see. It is just about eight o'clock on the dot and I'm getting ready to film my weekly wrap up for the last week of November but I thought that I would do a quick reading update first. So I listened to the entirety of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I'm gonna put the picture over here of the Audible original cover over here. So Audible original has two versions of A Christmas Carol. One of them is just narrated by Tim Curry and then the version that I listen to has a full cast of voice actors. And I have to say, this is probably the best audiobook I have ever listen to. So the best way I can describe this audiobook is that it literally feels like I'm listening to a movie because they not only had, you know, different voices for all of the characters, but they had every little sound effect you could imagine. Not only music, but just sounds of doors opening and closing. And for instance, you know, at the beginning of the story, there's Marley who comes to visit Scrooge first to warn him about the three ghosts. And, you know, he has all of these chains all over him and you can hear the dragging of the chains as he's walking throughout the house. It's things like that that make this audiobook just top notch. It was absolutely, absolutely incredible. If you have an Audible account, this is in the Audible Plus catalog. And it was cool to listen to this story because I have watched a ton of adaptations and I've read some retellings at this point. And one big thing that I noticed is Scrooge's character is kind of different in the original story. I feel like in general in the adaptations, Scrooge is meaner and he is more resistant to change. But in the original story, he's actually very receptive to the ghosts. Like even when Marley comes in, and like I said, Marley is the first ghost that Ebenezer comes in contact with. I mean, yeah, he's a bit shocked to see a ghost because he's never seen a ghost before. But once Marley starts talking to him, Scrooge is like, oh, this is happening for real. And he believes him right away when he tells him like, you're gonna be visited by three ghosts, you know, past, present, and Christmas to come. It's not a good or a bad thing. I just find it interesting that the adaptations tend to make his character more extreme than he is in the book. I liked seeing in the book that there are additional scenes and a couple of additional characters that aren't usually brought up in different adaptations. Um, it definitely added in another level to the story. And something else that I recently found out is that apparently Charles Dickens wrote this story when he himself was in financial peril and I think that that adds another emotional level to the story. While I was listening to it I could definitely hear and feel the despair from the writer himself and I just think that that makes the story all the more meaningful and impactful and there's a reason why this story is a classic and why so many people have done different movie adaptations and retellings and things like that. I mean, my personal favorite is The Muppets Christmas Carol. That has become a little bit of a tradition for me to watch that every year during the month of December. And I'm definitely planning on doing that again this year. I love The Muppets so much. And listen, a lot of those songs are bops. So I highly recommend watching it if you haven't yet. And then I did read the first few pages or so of A Very Highland Holiday, which is by a few different authors. I'm gonna get more into the synopsis of that bind up tomorrow because I really do want to get this video done that I'm about to film. But yeah, with that being said, I will talk to you guys tomorrow.
it is just about 4 30 in the afternoon on Tuesday. I did wake up kind of late today. I think I woke up at about like 12 30 and you can probably tell from the footage before this I stayed up pretty late last night because I had to completely edit and upload a video that went up today and I was also bullet journaling for the end of November into the beginning of December and watching TV shows and I stayed up even later to finish the first short story in A Very Highland Holiday which I'll talk about in a second. So today I read the second short story in this collection and then I also read the first 20% of In a Holidays by Christina Lauren so I'll get to this in a second but with A Very Highland Holiday this is an interesting short story bind up because they are all centering around the same sort of story and the same small town in the Scottish Highlands. So in 1746 there was this really awful battle at Culloden between the British and the Scots and so all of these short stories are centered around kind of the aftermath of that battle, different people that have been affected by it, and this small town where the battle took place essentially. And there's also this specific tavern called Balthazar's I think and all of these stories have a connection to that tavern as well. So the first short story and the second short story. The first one was by Catherine Levesque, the second one by Kerrigan Byrne. Those two stories are actually connected because they are about these two brothers. The first one centered around James and it took place in 1746 during the holiday season. So just like six months or so after that battle happened and James is trying to kind of solve the mystery of his brother Jonathan's death because Jonathan did die during that battle. He was fighting for the British side. And so he essentially goes to that tavern I mentioned to get some answers and he falls in love along the way. And I liked this short story. I think I would probably give it three stars. The problem for me was that the romance came off as like an afterthought. Definitely the story of James trying to find out answers about his brother and all of that, that was the main plot. And then the romance with this girl that works at the tavern was just just kind of added on I feel like. And then the second story, this one is by Kerrigan Byrne, this one centers around the brother Jonathan. Like I mentioned he's the one that was killed during the Culloden battle and he has been a ghost for 150 years at this point because this short story takes place in like 1891 I think. And so he has been haunting this tavern ever since 1746 when he passed away and this woman Vanessa comes to stay at the tavern and it's their romance. So it's a romance between a living person and a ghost and I was a little weirded out at first. I've definitely never read this kind of paranormal romance before. As the story went along it made more and more sense that these two people were falling in love with one another and the ending was really interesting. At first I wasn't quite sure what to think about it. I'm not going to spoil what happens because I really think that you should just read it for yourself because I found it to be a surprising and really kind of beautiful ending. The more time that I've spent away from the story since reading it a couple hours ago, the more that I really love the ending. And then like I said, I did start In a Holidays by Christina Lauren and right now I am on page 67 and that is just about 20% in because this book is only 300 pages and the audiobook is only about seven and a half hours so it's possible that I could actually finish this today. So just to tell you a little bit about the plot, we are centering around Malin Jones. She is 26 years old and this is interesting because it's kind of a found family story. So every year for Christmas around December 20th to the 26th, something like that, her family, which comprises of her mom and dad, which they're now divorced, but they still come together for this Christmas trip every year. Her younger brother, Miles, then her parents' friends, Lisa and Ricky, and their two sons, plus another couple and their kids, and then another friend of the family named Benny. So all of these people come together every year for Christmas to spend, I think, a week together at Lisa and Ricky's family cabin in Salt Lake City I believe or around that area. At the very beginning of the book their most recent trip is coming to an end. It is now December 26th. They are all getting ready to leave and go back to their own lives. And so May and Theo who have been lifelong friends and I mentioned Theo before because he's one of the two brothers Andrew and Theo um, that May has grown up with 
Um, she ends up getting drunk with Theo and making out with him the night before and it's now the morning after essentially and he kind of ignores her and starts acting weird around her and she just doesn't know what to do about that. And we learn pretty quickly that she's actually had a crush on Andrew who is the slightly older brother for years and years at this point. So she didn't even really want to make out with Theo and now he's acting really weird around her. And so needless to say the trip just doesn't end well because there's this weird thing going on between her and Theo and Andrew finds out about it and Andrew seems completely fine about the fact that May and Theo are together. Um, so it's just kind of a disaster for May. So then May and her family get in a car to go back to the airport so they can go home but they end up getting in a car accident. But instead of May waking up in a hospital or anything like that, she wakes up on December 20th at the beginning of the trip that she just experienced. So this kind of goes into the Groundhog Day-like plot where she's starting to relive the same few days over and over again. And so that's kind of where I stopped is kind of at the beginning of this time loop. So it's definitely a really interesting plot. I like all of the characters so far. May is a really relatable main character because she's 26 years old. I'm about that same age and she kind of feels stuck in her life. I'm just really interested to see what happens next. I think I'm just going to go ahead and maybe update you guys at some point tomorrow. Is Wednesday at 4 p.m. just about the same time that I updated you guys yesterday. So once again I slept in till like 12:30 today because once again I stayed up really late editing clips for this vlog and planning for videos on my channel. I have a feeling that tonight is going to be another late night because I'm trying to plan out all of my December videos at the moment and a lot of my ideas are going to take a lot of planning and work. So yeah, this is going to be a common theme in this vlog that I'm going to be sleeping in pretty late because of that. Um, so as far as a reading update, I finished In a Holidays by Christina Lauren last night, pretty late last night, which was one of the other reasons why I stayed up so late. And I'm giving this four stars. I feel like I got exactly what I expected out of this. I went into this thinking that it was going to be an adorable holiday themed rom-com with a time loop thrown in, you know, with magic thrown in. And that's exactly what this is. Like I said in yesterday's clip, I really enjoyed May's character. I find her very relatable. And her romance with Andrew, which is one of the two brothers that I talked about yesterday. And their friends to lovers romance was very cute. I don't really have much to say about it, except I will say the big conflict towards the end between May and Andrew, you know, usually in a romance novel, the couple has like a big fight or some big conflict and they break up for a time before getting back together at the very end of the novel. So the conflict between Andrew and May didn't really make all that much sense to me. Like I didn't really understand why Andrew was so mad at May. I just feel like his reaction was kind of weird and both of their grand gestures at the end were so adorable. May's in particular was the sweetest, probably the sweetest grand gesture that I've ever read about in a romance novel and it actually made me tear up a bit. Also, I loved the different holiday traditions that May and her family do every year. For instance, one of them was Snow Creature Day where all the family members team up with one another and try to see who can make the best snowman or snow creature. And then another one that I loved was the scavenger hunt. So once again, the family members would team up and go out into the local town. I think this cabin was in Park City, which is near Salt Lake City, if I'm not mistaken. And they would have to take pictures of certain objects and they would have to like go up to strangers and ask them to like sing a Christmas carol and they would have to film it for proof. And I just thought that that was so adorable. It definitely gave me some warm and fuzzy holiday feelings. So did this novel completely blow me away? No, but like I said, I got what I 
expected out of it. Um, the Unhoneymooners is still my favorite Christina Lauren novel and I'm waiting to see if they will write anything that tops that. So yeah, in terms of reading, I haven't read anything today because like I said, I woke up late and then I went for a walk with my mom and my dog Chloe. So I'm thinking today I really want to read at least two of the short stories in A Very Highland Holiday and then we'll kind of go from there. But I'll definitely let you guys know what I end up reading in my update tomorrow. All right. Hey guys, it is Thursday evening. Let's see. It is just about six o'clock right now. And the reason why I'm all done up right now is because I am getting ready to film my Christmas recommendations video. So of course that will be linked up in the cards above because that video will definitely be going up before this vlog. So in terms of a reading update, yesterday evening, I read two more short stories in A Very Highland Holiday. Uh, they were kind of meh for me, to be honest. I read Jennifer Ashley's. That one was okay. I'd probably give it three stars. Like, it was fine. And then Tanya Ann Crosby's was kind of boring, if I'm being honest. I definitely started skimming through that one. So this bind up has definitely been hit or miss for me. And that's not surprising to me because that happens with most anthologies or most short story collections that I read that some of them I really love, some of them not so much. I will say my favorite so far is Kerrigan Burns by far. And then I did enjoy Jennifer Ashley's. But yeah, the other two, not so much. So I think I have two more short stories to read in this. I don't think I'm going to make any more progress on this today because I have another book that I'm trying to work on. Um, but I'm hoping to get this done by tomorrow at some point. And then I also read the entirety of Once Upon a Winter's Eve by Tessa Dare. This is a novella in her Spindle Cove series. And as you can probably tell from the title, this does take place around Christmas time. At the very beginning of this novella, there is a Christmas ball going on in Spindle Cove. And this was essentially a second chance romance between our main character, Violet, and this guy, Christian. And basically a year or so before this novella starts, Christian and Violet had like a one night stand. And then Christian just like left the face of the planet. Violet had no idea where he went. I think Christian left a little note for her, but it wasn't very heartfelt or anything. So Violet is definitely left feeling very heartbroken. And so he randomly shows up at this ball, this Christmas ball, and he's pretty seriously injured. And so they all take care of him. And it turns out that Christian has been a spy for the English government. And so that's why he's been away. And so this is their second chance romance. Overall, I thought that this was a really cute little Christmas adventure. It takes place over the course of one night, essentially. It definitely wasn't Tessa Dare's best work by any means, but I had a fun time. I always have a fun time with her works. And I even put in my Goodreads review that I feel like anytime I read a Tessa Dare novel or novella or anything, it's like the literary equivalent of receiving a hug. I feel like that's the perfect way to describe her books and all of that. So that was all of my reading for yesterday. In terms of what I've read so far today, I haven't read all that much because pretty much right after I woke up, I had to do a grocery store pickup with my mom and then we took Chloe on a walk. Um, but I did get to start The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. My copy's downstairs, but you've already seen it in this vlog. Um, and I've read the first 50 pages of that and I'm already loving it. I can already tell this is gonna be a five-star read. Um, it just has a very fun and charming and whimsical vibe to it. Um, I'll get more into the plot and everything tomorrow. And then I did listen to the entirety of the the greatest gift and I cannot remember the author. I think it's Philip Van Doren Stern. That might be right. Um, but this is the very, very, very short story that inspired the incredible film, It's a Wonderful Life. So on Hoopla, it said that the audiobook was gonna be 50 minutes, but it turned out only being 30 minutes. And then the last 20 minutes was essentially an interview with Philip's daughter, which was actually interesting because it did add a lot of context to how the film came to be, how the story came to be and all of that. Um, overall, I think I'd give this three stars though, because at the end of the day, the short story itself was way too short. I mean, there was just no room really for character development or story. And basically the short story starts with George Bailey being on the bridge. He's contemplating suicide and then the angel shows up and then he very quickly goes through the town seeing what it would be like if he wasn't born. And then he very quickly goes back to the angel and tells him to reverse it back, you know, that he wants to live. So yeah, while I can never discount the effect that this little story has had on our society because of the inspiration 
for the incredible film, at the end of the day, this just was not what I was expecting. I definitely expected something with more substance to it. I will say there's one pretty big difference between this story and the movie that I actually kind of liked. And that is the scene when he's going through the town, you know, seeing what it would be like if he wasn't born. He comes across Mary, his wife from his original timeline. And it turns out that she married some other man and has had a couple of kids with him. But this man is a very angry alcoholic. And the reason why I find that very interesting is because in the movie they portray Mary as like an old maid, a spinster. She just works at the library because George never existed to marry her. And I find that to be like just a little problematic because I feel like the film was portraying that Mary would be far more miserable being single than she would being married to kind of an awful person. And I don't know about you, but I personally would much rather stay single for the rest of my life than marry someone with a temper problem and an alcoholism problem. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to briefly bring that up. Do I recommend this? I mean, eh? Like, if you want to, go ahead. Like I said, the audiobook's only 30 minutes, so like, you'll speed through it. But I don't think that it added all that much to my knowledge of the story anyway. Um, I've also had the amazing privilege of seeing the premiere of the opera that was composed of It's a Wonderful Life. It's by Jake Heggie, and it premiered at Houston Grand Opera, and it's probably one of the top five operas I've ever seen, and it makes me sad because nobody ever does it because nobody does Christmas operas really, so yeah, but it's an incredible, incredible opera. If you ever get the opportunity to see it, jump on it. Um, so yeah, for the rest of the night, I need to film this Christmas recommendations video. I also am about to go on a Zoom call with some really good friends of mine in like about an hour or so. Um, so we'll see how much reading I get done. I'm definitely planning on making more progress on uh, The House in the Cerulean Sea because like I said, I've only read 50 pages, but I'm already just adoring it. So I can't wait to get more into that. So yeah, I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Good morning everyone. So it is just about 10 30 a.m. on Saturday morning. The only reason why I'm up this early is because on Saturday mornings I teach a music performance class uh, at work at the studio that I work at and that class goes from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So every Saturday I have to get up at about 8 to make sure that I get to work on time. So in terms of a reading update, yeah, I didn't feel the need to update you guys at all yesterday. Yesterday was a pretty chill day. I didn't go on a walk or anything. I really just stayed home and tried to read as much as possible. So I read the last two stories in A Very Highland Holiday. And honestly, I'm just so happy that I finally finished it because it just seemed like the never ending anthology. <laughs> um, I think as a whole, I would give this collection three stars. Unfortunately, this did end up being pretty meh for me if I'm being honest with you guys, which I always am being honest with you guys. So the last two stories that I read yesterday, the first one was by Darcy Burke. That one was okay. I'd probably give that one three stars overall. So the last story was by Eliza Knight and it was loosely based off of How the Grinch Stole Christmas and it was such a fun time. So basically it was about this man Thane who was from one Scottish clan and his plan was to abduct a woman from the rival clan because the people from that rival clan murdered his twin sister like the year before and so that was his way of like stealing their Christmas was abducting one of the kind of important members of their clan but it turns out that she goes really willingly with him because she's just like over her brothers they just kind of want to marry her off to the highest bidder and she doesn't want to marry anyway especially for that reason so she actually plans on running away that night and they run into each other and he's like uh you're coming with me and she's like okay cool and they go to the inn the Baltazar's inn where all of these stories are based around and it was just a fun time so if I had to rate them all individually um I would give Catherine Levex she was the first story I gave hers three stars Kerrigan Burns four stars that was the ghost story one I really enjoyed that then Jennifer Ashley's I would probably give three stars that one was kind of a tie-in with her Mackenzie series and that was kind of fun but overall again I feel like it's focused 
a little too much on what I deem to be the B plot, which is the non-romance plot. And then the one after that, I think it was Tanya and Crosby's. I'd probably give that one two stars. I was getting pretty bored during that one and I definitely started skimming, especially towards the end. And Darcy Burks, like I said, three stars and Eliza Knight's four stars. So if you put all those together, I averaged it out to be three stars for the entire anthology. Then I got to read more of The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. So right now I am on page 219, that's chapter 12. And this book altogether has about like 395 pages. So I think I'm about 56% of the way through and I am listening to the audiobook for this while reading the physical copy at the same time. And I wholeheartedly recommend doing that because the narrator for the audiobook is doing a fantastic job of giving all of these whimsical and really interesting characters very distinctive voices and it's just a very entertaining time. So I definitely recommend going the audiobook route. So I don't think I've gone into the plot of this yet in this vlog so far, but we are centering around Linus Baker. He is 40 years old, I think, and he works in the department in charge of magical youth in this magical, fantastical world. And it's kind of like an urban fantasy because there's regular humans as well as magical people. And in the society, magical people are definitely the marginalized community. Humans definitely don't respect them. And with the department that Linus works for, his job is essentially as a caseworker and he goes to all of these different orphanages that house these magical children and he is trying to see if these orphanages need to be closed down, if they're doing a good job, things like that. And so he gets a notice from extremely upper management and he gets this new assignment to go to this island in the Cerulean Sea to this little house here up on a cliff where there are six magical children and they have various different abilities and they are definitely very unusual cases and so that's why they all live at this one kind of orphanage and so Linus's job is to investigate this orphanage as well as the man that runs it whose name is Arthur Parnassus and oh my goodness this is like one of the most adorable books i've ever read i am so unbelievably happy every time i go to read a bit from this book and i'm so excited to finish it today this book just strikes the perfect balance of whimsical and charming and wholesome and sweet and hilarious. I cannot tell you how many times I have just laughed out loud reading this and that does not happen very often for me when I'm reading books. I'm just like endlessly giggling to myself because the kids themselves are very entertaining and Linus's character is also entertaining because he, especially at the very beginning, he's a very like uptight person and he just has a very quirky sense of humor, I would say. And then Arthur, who is the man that runs the orphanage, he is just such a wonderful man. And you can tell that he loves these kids with all of his heart. And there is a romance brewing between Arthur and Linus. And I cannot wait for that to like really kick in because I can already tell it's gonna be like the sweetest romance ever. And I'm just so excited to get into this book that I'm going to leave the update that many hours later wow this book was so good oh my god i cried so much while reading this this book made me so emotional oh my god i'm gonna start crying again stop 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 this may be the perfect book for me personally this is easily my favorite book of the year i think i can say that now and definitely one of my top 10 favorite books of all time. I cannot wait to reread this over and over and over again throughout my life. Oh my god. You know what? I just need to read you the last two sentences of this book because they are just beautiful and I don't really think they spoil anything. So it says, Sometimes he thought to himself in a house in a cerulean sea, you were able to choose the life you wanted. And if you were of the lucky sort, sometimes that life chose you back. And that perfectly sums up this book. <sighs> oh my God. Like I said in my last update, this book really just strikes the perfect balance of whimsical and charming and sweet and wholesome and funny and it also just has so, 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 so much heart to it. 
oh my god I swear this book made my heart grow three sizes I feel like the Grinch right now my heart grew three sizes <laughs> from reading this incredible book. Oh my god, all these characters need to be protected at all costs. The romance between Linus and Arthur was everything that I could have asked for. Literally the most wholesome male-male romance you will ever read. There is literally nothing I would change about this book. It is just absolutely perfect. And I don't say that often with a lot of books that I read. Um, wow. Also, I do want to talk about Linus, who is our main character. I think that his character development was absolutely incredible. Because at the beginning of the book, he is a very faithful servant of the department in charge of magical youth. And throughout the book, he starts to learn and realize that the department is kind of corrupt and there are some really messed up things happening, especially in regards to the different orphanages that this department is in charge of, of course. And like I said, he becomes more loving and just more strong of a person. He starts to stand up for himself and the children and Arthur because he's slowly but surely falling in love with all of them. And also what I loved about his character development is that first of all, he is plus sized. Um, I think that men can be described as plus size. Now I'm thinking about it. I feel like women are usually described as plus size, but not men. But I'm going to use that word because to this day, I can't really use the word fat because it still has such negative connotations for me because I was bullied so much as a kid. We love trauma. Um, so I'm going to say plus sized. Um, and so at the beginning of the book, he's kind of obsessively dieting, just eating salads all the time because he's now 40 and he's overweight and he's, you know, worried that as he gets older, you know, things are going to get worse for him health wise. I think he has blood pressure issues as well. And also we see that he's just trying to take up as little space as possible. Like there's some scenes where he's at the department and all the desks are really close together and he's like trying to like wedge in between them and he feels so uncomfortable whenever he bumps into one of the desks. Um, but then by the end he comes to truly accept himself for who he is on the inside and the outside. And Arthur just loves him so, so much for who he is exactly as he is. And mm, it's just so good, it's so good, it's so good. This is it, this is the moment this is 2020 like this is it like this book will save 2020 this book might be the vaccine to cure COVID okay I'm, I'm going way over the top but you get it you get it I love this book with every fiber of my being if you don't read this you are making a huge colossal mistake it's about 9 p.m on Saturday I know I said that I wasn't gonna update it all today but I just had to say something to you guys right after finishing this perfect book here. Um, so in terms of reading plans going forward, you know, we only have one more day left of the readathon. I don't really have any other reading plans because I got through all of my TBR for the week, which is amazing. Um, and I'm kind of running out of holiday stories that I want to read right at this moment. There are some other books that I mentioned in my Christmas recommendations video, which of course that will be linked up in the cards above, um, that I would like to get to but I want to wait to get to those till closer to Christmas Day um, because I am planning on doing a Christmas reading vlog for like December 23rd through the um, 25th as kind of like a weekend reading vlog. I did that last year as well. I will also link that vlog up in the cards above. That was a fun time last year. And then I'll update you guys tomorrow in terms of what I plan on reading then. All right it is just about 5 30 p.m on Sunday December 6th. It is so weird filming right now because it is so dark outside and it's only 5.30 and it just feels so much later. I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels this way um, around the time that daylight savings time happens. Um, so yeah, I feel a little bit disoriented right now, but I thought I would give you guys another reading update and then kind of wrap up everything that I read for the readathon. So first things first, last night after I finished The House in the Cerulean Sea, I did read the entirety of Once Upon a Christmas Eve by Elizabeth Hoyt. This is a novella in her Maiden Lane series that of course is set around Christmas time. And I was really enjoying this at first. Like I would say the whole first half, I was really into it. I thought it was 
was a really fun premise. Basically, we have our two main characters, Sarah and Adam. And Adam and his grandmother were traveling via carriage. They were trying to get to somebody else's house, but there was just too much snow. And so they had to stop at Sarah's family's house. And they kind of have a past together. It's a little bit of a hate to love. Sarah definitely is not a fan of Adam because he's a rake. He's a playboy and she's just not into that. Um, but over the course of this novella, they of course fall in love. And that is actually my issue with this novella is that things happened way too fast. I feel like their story could have benefited from being a full novel because there just needed to be more character development and more time for these characters to become friends and then to become something more. And then by the end of it, he straight up proposes to her. Like things just happened so fast, it was unbelievable for me. So yeah, that's why I ultimately gave this three stars. It's not the worst novella that, that I've ever read, but it did not blow me away. And I definitely kind of expect more from Elizabeth Hoyt. So I was a bit disappointed by this. And then in terms of what I've been reading today, I have been so into this book. I'm already 40% of the way through. And that is Wolf by Wolf by Ryan Groden. This is definitely not a Christmas story. This is definitely not a happy time. But for those of you guys that don't know, this is book one in a duology. The first book is Wolf by Wolf. The second book is Blood for Blood, which I just requested for my library to purchase because this is a library copy. As you can see, it's very shiny. So the premise of this, we have our main character, Yael. This is taking place in 1956 in an alternate reality where the Axis powers, the Third Reich and Imperial Japan won World War II. And so every year there is this motorcycle race. It is like the most insane motorcycle race you can think of because basically all these contestants are racing throughout most of Europe into Africa, into Asia, all the way to Tokyo, Japan. Like it's a weird like U-shape from what was Berlin but is known now as Germania I think. So from Germania into Africa into Asia like India so it's like a very big U all the way up to Japan somehow. I don't know how they're gonna make it to Japan because it's an island but we shall see. So Yael is a skin shifter. She can shift her appearance. She cannot shift her gender, but she can shift everything else about her appearance. The only thing that she cannot shift though is things like wounds or tattoos, things that are like embedded into her skin. And when she was six years old, her and her mother were sent to a concentration camp. She is Jewish and she was experimented upon and that is how she is now able to skin shift. And so she has shifted into one of the motorcycle racers. She's now impersonating this racer. I'm definitely on the edge of my seat the entire time that I'm reading this. Uh, Yael is like a badass bitch. Like she is such a cool main character to follow. It's just unbelievable to me how brave she is. She's been through so much, but she is more than ready, willing, and able to do this mission. Basically her goal is to win the motorcycle race so that she can get close enough to Hitler to murder him. And I'm just so here for this. I cannot wait to finish this. I think I might even finish this at some point tonight just because I'm just so, so into it. So now I thought I would just wrap up everything that I've read this week for you guys. So first up, I finished A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, gave that five stars, highly, highly recommend the audiobook. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, next, I finished In a Holidays by Christina Lauren. I finally got my book of the month edition in, I think yesterday. So I'm gonna return my paperback, but I love this book of the month edition because it is a hardcover and I just love everything about this cover. So gave that one four stars, definitely an adorable holiday romance. Then I have Once Upon a Winter's Eve by Tessa Dare. I did decide to give this three stars after just kind of thinking about it the past couple days. It's definitely not a four star in my mind, but it wasn't terrible. It just like was an okay novella in my opinion. The Greatest Gift by Philip Van Doren Stern gave this one three stars as well. Then we have A Very Highland Holiday, but which is by like a ton of authors, gave that one three stars as well. Then I finished The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. You guys know, obviously gave this five stars. It's one of my favorite books of the year, if not my top favorite book of the year. And then what else do we have? Um, Once Upon a Christmas Eve by Elizabeth Hoyt gave that three stars. And then, like I said, I'm 
currently reading this, but I could definitely see myself giving this at least four to five stars. It is that compelling and that interesting. So yeah, that's going to be it for this Tis the season of thon reading vlog. I hope you guys enjoyed and I would love it if you would leave a comment down below if you want to discuss any of these books or if you want to give me Christmas recommendations or anything like that. I always love hearing from you guys and I would also love it if you would leave a like and subscribe and I thank you in advance if you do. And with that being said, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!